Serious what is the creepiest thing you don't talk about in your profession? I'm a mailman, and sometimes people's houses just creep me out. Sometimes you walk up to a really rundown place with their mailbox hanging sideways and you just get a bad feeling. Like bad things happen here it's also creepy how bad some people's houses smell. And I can smell that shit from outside. If you're a hoarder with 20 cats I can smell all the cat piss and sweet rotting smell as soon as I go up your walkway. Also delivering mail to sketchy businesses that are clearly fronts for something else is never really fun. Can make you pretty uneasy. Honestly, the fact that most stuff we deal with causes cancer. Generally, you can be quite safe as a chemist, but it's the long-term exposure that's an issue. Being somewhat not safe over time causes lots of issues. Sure, you always hear of someone who got a liter of solvent to the face, or got a toxic powder on their arm and was fine, but it's the sum of all your exposures, not the day-to-day -day stuff that kills you. Be smart and be safe. Wear gloves. Wear a lab coat. Don't breath anything in, and work in a fume hood with everything. Lab safety is paramount, the little things adding up is what'll get ya for sure. Anyways, I gotta wash my hands with benzene, before I leave the lab, see ya. I run pools, we make sure our swimming instructors have good training, in spotting the signs of child abuse, because we see so much more of your kid's body than most other folks in their lives. Bathing suits don't do much to cover up suspicious bruising. Yikes, but also thank you. There are a lot of nasty ass bugs in shipping. The fact that human organs are shipped, like regular packages at FedEx. I see them almost every day. It's most a company called Cryolife I think. It's for organ donation. But we are very professional and careful with these packages in particular for obvious reasons. I did the holiday temp thing at FedEx a few years ago, and one of first deliveries one day was a bunch of human fucking hearts, and I just was not prepared for that. My roommate's first day at FedEx he shipped a bunch of horse seamen. Yeah I'll have very different introductions. Oh how lovely horse seamen. The amount of dead bodies you have to deal with slash walking on. Property management for 5 communities with 2400 people. 95% college students. 60% of those in high stress. High octane majors. I've walked into 4 suicides in 5 months. And these have been people I've gotten to know. To Worked with to cater to interests. I couldn't imagine it was going to be like this, but I probably should've. I dk how to fix any of it, but it makes for a hard time now and again. I worked in property management for 6 years and never found a dead body. Finding a resident dead was one of my biggest fears. Sorry you had to experience so much of that. I work for a company that, amongst other services provides carpet cleaning. Vacuuming is one of the easiest corners for janitorial providers, to cut so it rarely ever gets done to adequate levels. This means that office carpeting, is absolutely filled with dirt, skin flakes, and literally any other nasty tiny thing you can picture. Carpeting is like a sponge slash filter, and if you don't clean it out regularly it gets fucking nasty, and can majorly impact indoor air quality. Sick building syndrome can be caused by carpeting alone. Also, people in general are nasty too. In one night, in one facility. My team cleaned up piss, vomit, and blood stains on the carpet, wearing PPE of course. The amount of skid marks we clean off office chairs is bonkers too. The amount of skid marks we clean off office chairs is bonkers too. Ah uh, what the fuck? How? Do people in your office not wear pants? I wish I never knew this, but I was a hairdresser for a while, and at one point was working in a not so good area. I had just started at this new salon. And the owner warned me to watch out for an older man who would come in after a young girl. That in and of itself was kind of strange, but nothing too jarring. It's also important that we had almost no staff. Do I work many 6 to 7 hour shifts by myself? Well, one day a young woman, maybe 25 years old, came in, and an older man behind her, who said absolutely nothing. I took her to the chair, and like everyone else, Asked her what she wanted. She pulled me close to her, and said that man there thinks I'm getting my head shaved. He gave me $100, but just trim it. I look back at the man, and there he was, starting to masturbate in the corner. I told him to leave, and called the police. The girl started crying in the chair. It was by far the creepiest thing I've seen. I never knew people had fetishes like that. I wish I never knew. First of all, WTF. Second of all, how has this happened enough times, that the owner knew it would happen again? They probably tipped well before. I drive trains. 
Statistically speaking a driver in my country will drive over two humans during a career. What really haunts you is the sound. It's a loud thud. In Britain I think the train company will retire you after you run over three. Could be two. Three's the maximum due to the emotional stress. I don't know about creepy, but a lot of dietitians have slash had eating disorders. It can attract people who are one obsessed with food and health into looking for better ways of staying as thin as possible. On a similar note, I studied psychology, and every therapist I've met had some sort of mental illness. But really it makes sense that people would want to go into a field that they are personally invested in. I got stalked for 9 years by a woman that is a child psychologist at a school, so I can relate. As a teacher, we know, but don't talk about it how many of our kids have very fucked up lives. We know which kids have emotionally abusive siblings. We know which kids have no friends. We know which kids' parents pay no attention to their accomplishments. When it's something that crosses the line, sexual abuse, unsafe living conditions, etc. We will report it to CPS. Hell, as far as I'm aware, we are required to in every state, certainly are in mine. But, there are so many horrible, horrifying, things that kids have to go through that don't cross the line into reportable territory. For example, one of my students two years ago was the only boy out of five children. His mother, her husband having walked out after baby hash five was born, took all of her aggression out on my student. It was never abusive, to our knowledge. But, he confided in me that his mother just didn't care about him. Any accomplishment of his sister's was praised and celebrated. His accomplishments, ignored. The kid was one of the sweetest boys I have ever taught. All he wanted was to make his mother proud of him. She couldn't have cared less though, because to her he was just a reminder of the man who left her. The kid was emotionally neglected and starved for positive attention. We also know about the kids who have had seriously fucked up shit happen to them. Rape, molestation, severe physical abuse, even torture. One girl I taught was raped by her father and her uncle for years. Her uncle moved out of the country and her father is in prison. The situation has been resolved legally, but she is still facing years and years of psychological problems. So, to end my rambling, the creepiest thing about my profession that we don't talk about is how many of our students are messed up and facing years of therapy because of things beyond their control. Even worse, most of them kids aren't going to get therapy, especially after they become an adult. The number of deaths and injuries. Industrial maintenance isn't a really safe career path. I personally know four people that have been seriously injured and to that were killed on the job. The amount of suicide among doctors. Physicians have among the highest rates of suicide worldwide. But I didn't understand how significant it was until I was in the field. I assumed it wasn't a big issue. The career seemed great with prestige, high job security and income. And it is great. But I didn't know about working 60 days in a row, operating after being awake for 72 hours on call, cutthroat competition in training bottlenecks, the constant expectation and pressure to be the best, and know it all from seniors and patients alike, the harassment and bullying from colleges that eat their young. Now that I'm working in hospital networks, I don't go more than a couple of months without hearing about another doctor who attempted or committed suicide. There is more open discussion about the crisis, but most remains unspoken. Many doctors in my country won't disclose or seek help for their mental health problems out of fear they'll be reported and have restrictions on their license. And if you are taken to hospital for the suicide attempt, the field is small enough that your colleagues and friends will hear about it. No matter how much staff maintain confidentiality, I visited a friend in Iku who attempted suicide, and he was mortified that he had been transported to the hospital he was employed in. Everyone knew and he moved across the country, and you hear about funerals for an untimely passing of a 30-something year old doctor, while nobody talks about how or why they died. We are very uncomfortable talking about suicide. People just don't understand. They think people decide to commit suicide. It's not a decision. It's a reaction. Like a frog that pisses on you when you pick it up. It's security at a lot of places is a joke. You'd be horrified how it's some high profile slash hold a lot of your personal data there isn't really an emphasis on security. Sure they do just enough, but it's more aimed at protecting their image and whatnot at your data. Especially with schools, you'd think sensitive and private data on thousands of children would be better protected. It's as if they didn't care. Sometimes when we deliver a stillborn baby that passed a while ago the head may come off in delivery. Fortunately it usually doesn't. This reminds me, I had a stillborn at 6 months. 
walked around two days with a dead baby inside, while my cervix was dilated naturally, I found out that the skin slus off, so she was born without skin, I could have done without those three days in my life. I'm so sorry. Thank you. It's been 19 years now, so I've had time to heal and move on. I have four boys and a grandson now. Life is good. The smell of burning human flesh. I'm an industrial welder and occasionally have a molten blob of steel land on exposed skin. We don't mention it outside of work because of obvious reasons. I have a bunch of scars on my right forearm from welding burns that several doctors have accused me of being an fourth drug user because of. Not really creepy, but I work at a wood shop, and it is an absolute OSHA disaster. Safety guidelines are early, if ever enforced, and corners are cut constantly to get stuff built on time. I'm talking fire extinguishers buried behind scrap wood and other things, almost zero use of safety equipment, and just a general disregard for what should be standard practice. Really the only reason injuries are rare is because the vast majority of people who work here are experienced and know their shit. A small percentage of people getting tattooed have HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, etc. And they are not always honest on their release forms. I was taught to always treat every client as if they have hepatitis C. So everyone gets the same precautions, safety measures, and equipment sterilization. It's tough though, because we'll have sketchy people that probably use drugs, or come in wanting their house party tattoo fixed, and we have no idea if they were sharing needles. We either make a judgment and deny them service, or treat them like everyone else and use precaution. I've only had one person be honest and tell me they had HIV while they filled out their paperwork. You don't use different needles for every customer? Trucker here, raped by trainers, particularly men, on female trainees is kind of an issue that has only really started to come to light. Holy shit, that's a pretty crazy thing to never talk about. Yeah. They are trying to mitigate it, by pairing as many women trainees with women trainers as possible. I work in TV news, and some viewers can be the right eye creepy. People subconsciously feel, like they know us, because they see us every day, in their homes. Some of the male my coworkers receive is so questionable. Like one guy, a well-known and beloved weatherman regularly gets postcards from the same dude that hates him and berates him. Another guy acts as if he actually knows one of our weekend anchors. In his letters talking about how they used to go to various concerts together. Nope. Once I opened a package with all these random objects. Band-aids. Layers. A pair of socks. Conversation hearts and five valentines each detailing how the person would storm the building. Once I did a story vaguely related to vaping, and within minutes a guy tracked down my personal FASA book, and sent me three videos cussing me out, and a long rant about how I was a pesantor and a fucking moron. I was a nighttime DJ for nine years at a small radio station back in the 90s. God I received some weird phone calls, and had six stalkers. Sometimes it seemed every psycho in town was listening to my show. A couple of them showed up at the station too. One time the door greeter at Walmart went insane, and after she was fired she had lots of time on her hands, so she started calling me, wanting me to broadcast these cassette tapes she said contained messages she was receiving from God. I quickly learned why DJs don't use their real names, and learned my town had quite a few disturbed people living in it. Military. A lot of people I served with were really fucking dumb, including officers. Also, cancer rates among retirees are insanely high. This isn't necessarily creepy, but unsettling. I used to work in the travel industry. You'd be surprised at how many people seriously injure themselves, or even die while on vacation. People tend to think they're invincible when they're abroad. Spoiler alert, you are not. By travel insurance. Yup, someone died on our honeymoon cruise, right in front of us on the beach. Rumor on the ship had it, he didn't have insurance, and his poor widow had to stay behind, to shepherd his body back to our home country. This is especially tragic. Repatriation can easily cost over dollar sign 10k. I'd just go with the flow. Burial at sea. In education as an administrator, the reality of the frequency of child sexual assault or child abuse and lasting trauma resulting from it is enough to make you drink. It is so shocking the level of incompetence in parents. This is across both private schools, well-off demographics and high needs. High poverty districts. It is really hard to come to school each day and mask positivity some days. I work in an eco-friendly importer who imports, well, 
eco-friendly products that replace disposable or single-use products, especially plastics. The amount of plastic involved in production, shipping, storing, and packing those items is insane. It's just all stripped from the finished product before it lands in the customer's hands. There's also issues with ordering from abroad. Everything from factory waste to the fuels to get it here. It's really, really sad. And nobody addresses it. Ever. It's not talked about. We just strip off the plastic and toss it before shipping to the customer. Not really creepy but sad. And so very obviously ignored. It's amazing how packaged things are. It already feels wasteful in store, but the packaging that comes even before being sold is huge. For instance, in a lot of clothing stores each item comes wrapped individually in plastic. Such a massive waste. The amount of teachers who sleep with students. Every school I've been at there has been a story of Mr. So and so got fired for having sex with one of the students a few years back. I've talked to teachers who make remarks about 15 year old girls bodies. That would be embarrassing to retell. I've heard rumors of students who get a little unwanted attention from some teachers. Improper stuff happens far more than you hear about on the news. IDK if it's really creepy, but drug and alcohol use on the job in construction is a big issue that's almost never explicitly addressed in the industry. To keep up or relax a little during the day some guys all use stimulants or drink on their breaks and lunch. And because maximum production is the goal on most jobs it tends to be left alone until it causes problems. It's not nearly as widespread as it once was, but it's still a big problem and the amount of supers and foremen, typically older guys, many of whom have done the same at some point in the past and would definitely know how to recognize it or are willing to look the other way for the sake of production when one of their guys is taking pulls of Jameson slash snorting lines slash popping Adderall in the parking lot on their breaks slash lunches downright scary. I worked masonry for a bit. I can vouch for this. Hell. Being guilty of it myself. Truth is, you gotta be one tough SOB, or use something to get through the week. When you start work at 7am, and end at dark Monday through Saturday it takes its toll. Not saying it's right. Not saying it's justifiable. Just saying it is. When the boss man says the block work on the 9 story hotel is due in 6 weeks. It's due in 6 weeks. I think a lot of people have never had to work in a physically demanding job like that. It seriously takes a lot out of you. Beats the hell out of you on every level, if you're not careful. I've worked with so many bitter, burnt out and beat to hell old men it's not even funny. Definitely not a job for everyone. Patients perception of their doctors is almost entirely based on our people skills slash communication. But this does not correlate very well to the quality of our medical decision making. The reality is that there is a huge range within the medical community as far as motivation to learn and improve, being up to date with the latest research, etc. And sometimes friendly doctors are terrible decision makers. Likewise, some have no people skills to speak of, but are some of the smartest and hardest working people on the planet. The best way to assess your doctor's decision making is to go off the recommendations of other doctors. But even that is not 100% reliable, because a lot of us are hesitant to publicly criticize our colleagues. I'm a medically complex patient, and this is so true. I once needed emergency surgery, and overheard someone referring to one of the staff as somewhat experienced. I flagged someone down, and asked what that was about. It turned out my surgeon, whom I had already pegged as someone with zero personality and a doctor god thing going, was very, very experienced and very, very skilled, and very particular about how his all ran. And the somewhat experienced staffer was somewhat experienced with Dr. God's particulars, which meant the surgery would go more smoothly. Jude was extremely arrogant, and had a terrible bedside manner. But the vast majority of time I spent in his presence, I was unconscious. So I didn't care, lol. My rheumatologist barely says two words to me, but I'll be damned if she hasn't changed my world for the better. The most she talks is when she ultrasounds joints in her office and gets so excited and explains everything on the screen. Finding a good room is gold. There are things about my clients I know that I shouldn't. Some of them don't know that I know, and some of them know I know. Things unrelated to the job I provide for them. I'm a gardener. That we've been hacked. Repeatedly, any data you trusted us with is out there now, either for sale, or just to freely download, if you find the right site. The only reason your identity has not been stolen, is that the thieves chose to steal someone else's today, and there are orders of magnitude more honest people than there are professional identity thieves. 
Pure random luck is the only reason your credit rating is not in tatters right now. None of this is publicized, because the laws were deliberately written in such a way that we decide what constitutes a breach, and that decision is never meaningfully accountable to anyone. So, surprise, we have never declared that any of the times that we were hacked constituted a formal breach. Can attest to this. Currently unwinding a massive theft and a lot of drama courtesy an IDT slash hacker has taken weeks and will to come. A huge number of people, even in the police and bank, just laughed it off as crazy when I started reporting it. It was only when one of the bank's fraud team found that someone else had opened an account across town in my name while I was in the air and that there was evidence of tampering on the notes that people started taking long and serious discussions. The image of being impenetrable is pervasive. Probably too late for anyone to read this, but I work for a social media influencer who everyone praises for keeping it real, and being such a nice and lovely person. Reddit. She's a huge bully and a total psycho. What you see in her posts is so fake. It's scary to me, that so many people look up to her, and even say she has cured their depression, or made them feel happy again. I'm glad that those people feel better about themselves, but this girl is not a good person, and has contributed to the mental breakdown of more than one person I roll. I wish people wouldn't believe everything they see on social media. It freaks me out how she's able to make herself look like such a saint when she's so nasty. This sounds like Gabby Hanna. Lol. 